The art of mastering has been an elusive topic to me for many years. It seems shrouded in mystery with many of the industry secrets locked behind closed doors. So for the last two months, I've been scrounging the internet for any material I can find about this topic. And some of the content creators I found with valuable information include Ian Shepard, Joe Gilder, Glenn Schick, Andrew Sheps, drum and basses break and resound, as well as white C audio. As my mission is to help you succeed in music, my goal here is to learn the art of mastering intricately so I can then disseminate that knowledge to you. And I'll leave a link down below to all the resources that I found helpful towards my journey. So throughout my channel, I'm going to be documenting my journey of learning the art form of mastering. And today I'm going to be showing you what I've learned so far mastering one of my tracks. Now don't look to me as an authority on mastering. I'm simply learning and then passing on that knowledge to you. And as I learn more, my mastering process will change. Now the goal of mastering is to get your track to sound loud and dynamic and to get it to translate across a wide variety of audio systems. With dance music, you want it to get it punchy and loud so it translates well in a DJ mix. The general theme today is it's all about making small movements which add up to a greater whole. Comment down below and let me know what is in your mastering chain. Oh, by the way, my name is Stranger. If you're looking to improve your music production, especially with dance music and drum and bass, then this channel is for you. And hey, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. That helps me know if I should make more videos like this. All right, without further ado, let's get right into it. The first step to mastering is knowing your listening environment. Make sure you have a good set of reference monitors that you know intimately but lack of one you can use a good pair of headphones there's one legendary mastering engineer by the name of glenn schick and he masters strictly on headphones and he's done masters for many grammy award-winning artists so if he can do it you can too it's all about knowing the nuances of how your listening environment responds to sound a tip I heard recently from an engineer is to never do a mastering project on a set of speakers you don't know, because then you have no objectivity. So use a set of speakers or headphones that you know very well, that you've listened to on for hundreds of hours. That way you know the sound intimately. So these headphones that I have right now are the Bayer Dynamic DT990 Pro. They're really crisp and clear, a really flat signal and they have really great stereo separation. It allows you to really fine tune the details of your mix and master. Just make sure you get the open back version for mixing and mastering because they have a little more of an open sound, much like listening on a pair of speakers. The closed back are more for recording so there's no bleed into the microphone. Also make sure you get the ones with the right ohm setting. So I have the 250 ohm version. Some sound cards may require a preamp because it may not have enough juice to feed into the 250 ohms. So the software platform that I'm using to do mastering is WaveLab and it's an industry standard for the mastering process. However, you can do mastering completely in your DAW. It's just that WaveLab has a bunch of functions and meters that facilitate the mastering process. Before you begin the mastering process, make sure you have a good reference track. Look for a track that's already mastered and sounds close to how you would like your track. That way you have something to aim for when you master your track. In terms of your pre-master file, the file format should be in 24-bit audio and I usually export it at 44 kilohertz, but I have heard some engineers prefer higher sample rates. It's really up to you. But the 24-bit resolution gives you additional headroom so you don't have to worry about having extra headroom for the mastering stage. As long as the file is not clipping or distorting, you should be good. 
The goal of your pre-master file is to get the mix sounding as good as possible before entering the mastering stage. There's a misconception that mastering engineers can fix all your mix issues and make a bad mix sound good with mastering. Having a bad mix doesn't always equate to a good master, but having a good mix usually leads to a good master. Gain staging is another important technique in the mastering process. Essentially what gain staging is, is the adjustment of your input level going into your effect or plugin. The goal here is to apply sufficient input signal into your plugin because a lot of these mastering plugins are designed to behave like analog equipment where pleasant nuances and harmonics are only produced when the signal is driven to a certain level. Just make sure you don't clip or distort the signal. So learning how to read the VU meter is an important skill in this process. Unlike the regular peak meters that you find in your DAW, the VU meter has a slower response rate, much like the human ear, which gives you a great understanding of the average intensity of your audio signal. Just note that the reading on your VU meter will look different compared to your peak meter. Usually a reading of zero on your VU meter means about negative 18 dB on your peak meter. So the meter I'm using is the MV meter by TB Pro Audio and this is a free VST. So I'll leave a link down below so you guys can grab it. And I'll just play you my pre-master so you can see how the VU meter works. <laughs> So notice how the needle is hovering around the zero area. That's where you want it to be. It can be a bit higher, uh, just as long as it's in that area, you're getting enough signal into your plugins. If you're not getting enough signal, then you'll have to increase the gain on your pre-master. Or if it's going way above the plus three, then you may have to reduce the gain. So I might increase it just a little bit so we get a little bit of juice into these plugins. I'll just add a dB. <laughs> So let's talk about the limiting stage. Essentially the limiting stage creates the overall loudness of your track. For years now, there's been an ongoing debate against loudness over dynamics. However, in dance music, the signal is generally louder. In recent times, we are seeing a trend more towards dynamics though. Now I picked up this technique by watching Brake's mastering video on computer music. And what he does is right when he begins a mastering session, he applies a limiter at the end of the mastering chain. This allows you to hear more pronouncedly all the effects you'll be applying before the limiter stage. Now to get an understanding of how loud we should make this, we're gonna uh, compare it against my reference track. And I'm gonna use this loudness meter, which gives us a reading in a unit called LUFS. Now I'm gonna leave a link down below so you can read more on what a LUF is, but essentially it's a new unit to measure loudness across different platforms. <laughs> So the reading I'm getting is around negative eight LUFs. So I'm gonna go back into my track. Then I'm gonna bring up my limiter and adjust the threshold until we get a loudness reading similar to our reference track around negative eight. <laughs> Yeah, so my threshold is at negative seven and that gives me a pretty loud signal. Now the limiter that I'm using is Isotope's Ozone 9 Maximizer. Now there's several different modes here which determine how the limiter responds to the signal. I'm using IRC4 set to modern. Uh, it seems to give you the best results. There's less distortion and weird artifacts and it kind of preserves the transients a little more. Now just make sure your ceiling is set to negative 0.1 or negative 0.2. This is an industry practice to prevent intersample peaking. Essentially when your digital signal is converted back to analog through your speakers, 
those jagged edges on your digital signal is rounded out. And that may result in peaking above your ceiling. So this prevents any clipping that may result from that. So the next step in our mastering stage is tonal balance. And to achieve this, we use EQing. And it's all about making small movements. We're not mixing here, so we're not making drastic movements. We're simply applying small changes to enhance and balance the signal. Now the EQ that I'm using is the Amic EQ200 and it's part of the Plugin Alliance Mastering Bundle. And I'm on their monthly subscription and the price is quite affordable in terms of the plugins that you have access to. And it's great if you want to get into mastering that because there's so much that is available to you. So once again, I'm just making small movements. I'm using a high shelf and boosting all the frequencies above 3.5K. I'm just boosting about 0.9 dB. Likewise, I'm boosting with a bell curve around uh, the 2.4 kilohertz area. And again, just a small movement at 0.7 dB. And then there's a bigger boost at the 400 hertz area to give it a little more beef here. I just want to give that mid bass a little more beef. So I'm boosting a bit more here. Now the stereo width knob is great. Increases the width of your signal. Just don't go too drastic because then it's gonna destroy your signal. So about 120% is good. And this mono maker is great. So anything under 111 Hertz is set to a mono signal and this helps keep your bass in the center. And that's pretty much all I'm doing in this EQ. Now, uh, once again, gain staging is important. So when you make all these small movements, the overall signal is gonna become louder. Now, the issue with that is that the human ear perceives louder as better, and that may not always be the case. So to resolve this issue, we wanna dial the output gain back a little bit so that when you bypass the signal, the overall loudness is the same. So I brought the gain down by negative 0.2. So now we can compare the signal before and after the EQ with an apples to apples comparison. So here's before. And here's after. Now the change was so subtle, you may not notice a difference, but the whole concept of mastering is about making small movements, which add up to a greater whole. Now, the reason why I like this EQ, it has a very beautiful and transparent sound. It's a great EQ to apply in your mastering stage. It's based on some legendary mastering EQ, so it sounds really nice. Now, I like to add a second level of EQing for some precision tasks here. So I have the BX Digital V3 here, which is another popular mastering EQ, part of the Plugin Alliance mastering bundle. And what I'm doing here is we have a number of parametric EQs. On the middle section here, we have some more big picture EQing. So you can increase the presence, which is the high end to add a little more excitement in that area. Similarly, you have the base shift, which adds a little more energy in the lower ranges. So I boosted the highs by 1.3 and added a bit more bass by 0 0.3. From adding the, these highs, I noticed that it was a bit peaky. So up here, I'm using a shelf to duck the high end by about negative 1.5. I'm doing some more sculpting here, boosting some uh, lower mids here as well for some body. And again, I'm doing some gain staging here and reducing the overall output by negative 0 0.6 dB. So we have that apples to apples comparison. So here it is without the EQ. And here it is with. And just so you can see the overall change, here is the completely dry pre-master. And here it is with both EQs enabled.
Now let's just check out against our reference track to make sure that our EQing movements are correct. So that sounds good to me. Hey, if you want to support me and you need some awesome serum base presets, you can grab my gnarly serum preset pack. And I'll leave a link down below. All right, the next step in the mastering process is tonal control. And that relates to using compression and dynamics to control certain frequency ranges. So I'm using ProFilter's multi-band compressor here. And what I'm doing is I have two bands to control the sub bass as well as the uh, kick bass area. So I'll solo the sub bass here. So that's with the uh, compression off. So what I'm doing with the compressor is I'm controlling the dynamics of the sub bass so that it doesn't distort when it goes through the limiter. And here's the lower mid band. Now notice when I play it together, if I bypass them both, the signal is starting to clip and distort. So that's what we're trying to achieve here is to control the dynamics here. So that lower range doesn't cause distortion. So notice now when I enable the compressor in both bands, That sounds a lot more cleaner and transparent. Now, I just want to warn you guys that multi-band compression is a very complex and advanced skill to learn. So if you're not comfortable with multi-band compression, I would even recommend skipping this stage. You can also achieve tonal control just by using EQ to balance those bottom end and other frequency ranges that are causing an issue. Through my study of different mastering engineers, I have noticed that some don't actually include a multiband compression in their process. So that's completely fine if you skip this stage. So again, here is a comparison with some gain staging and this is before the multiband compression. And here it is after. So a lot more control and a cleaner signal. All right, the next stage to mastering is adding character and coloration to your audio. So the whole idea with this stage is that before we were applying effects that had a more flat response, whereas in this stage, we're passing it through different effects to add character and coloration to our audio. So there are certain plugins that mimic analog equipment and produce pleasant nuances, randomness, and harmonics to your audio to give that cool analog character. So I'm going to use a couple of plugins to add some coloration. The first step, I'm adding this Kramer HLS channel strip. And I'm not actually doing anything on this EQ other than turning this low end knob to the 60 hertz uh, range. I'm not adding any gain to it. The way this was designed is that based on the analog um, gear, when you switch this knob, even though you're not increasing the gain, there's an actual bump on that curve and it adds a nice roundness to your bonobin. So I got this trick from the mixing legend, Andrew Sheps. And once again, I'm tucking the output gain a bit because that bass boost does increase the overall volume. So here it is without HLS. <laughs> And here it is with HLS.
adds a little bit of warmness to that bottom end. All right, so the next stage of coloration, I got this trick from Break, and this is a popular mastering EQ. It's called the Dangerous Bax EQ. And again, this is in the Plugin Alliance Mastering Bundle. I'm not sponsored by them, by the way, but I really enjoy this bundle, especially if you want to get into mastering. It gives you access to pretty much every plugin you need to master a track. So the concept of this EQ is it is based on the Baxendahl curve. And apparently this was used to design many of the vintage uh, EQs in your uh, audio system. So when you see that treble and bass knob on those vintage amplifiers, uh, they're probably using the Baxendahl curve and they have a pleasant sweet sound to this curve, which is why we like to add it for some coloration in the master. So the way this works is there is a low shelf and a high shelf. And what I'm doing here is I'm boosting the high shelf about 1.5 dB and the curve starts at around 7100 hertz. And then there's a high cut here because since we're using a shelf, it's gonna boost all the frequencies to the right of that frequency point and it might boost those super high end frequencies that are unnecessary so you can use this uh, high cut to balance that out and you can choose how far down that frequency spectrum you want to shave off uh, but i think uh, 70 000 hertz is probably good there's a apparently there's a curve to it so it still shaves off some of those um higher frequencies around the 20 hertz range so 70 i'd say try 70 or even 28 and then uh, bottom end i'm just boosting it just a little bit we already have a tons of bass here so it's not really what required but you can add some additional oomph to that bass by boosting it just a notch and i'm have it set at that 84 hertz area and again there's a cut to cut those super low frequencies and once again i'm bringing down the gain a bit for some gain staging and here it is without the back cq <laughs> and here it is with <laughs> Notice that there's a little more air on that top end. And now I have a third step of coloration, and this is another very popular mastering uh, plugin. It's a vintage compressor based on the Shadow Hills industry compressor, and there's two stages of compression. And actually, I'm bypassing the compression stages, and I'm simply passing it through this unit to get the benefits of that analog modeling. The compressors aren't doing anything, we're just passing it through. So here it is without Shadow Hills. And here it is with. It probably is so subtle it's not noticeable, but it's adding some analog coloration to your track. All right, so the next stage of the mastering process is dynamics. And we're using compression to control the peaks of the track so that the limiter at the end of the stage doesn't have to work as hard. So I have this SSL mastering compressor here and the threshold is just down a bit. So the compressor is only working a little bit. So this uh, VU meter shows the gain reduction in other words, how much it is compressing and is doing at most 0.5 to 1 dB of gain reduction. It's not doing much, it's just taming a little bit of those peaks. And this compressor actually has some coloration to it as well. I've enabled the analog section to uh, create some of those analog nuances. You probably won't notice it, but here it is without the SSL. And here it is with. All right, and then I have a second stage of compression where we're doing a little more work on the dynamics. And what I'm doing here, I have a high pass filter here. Now this is the Ozone 9 Dynamics 
compressor. And what's great about this compressor is you can feed a high pass side chain signal. The whole idea here is that you don't want that bottom end energy to affect the compressor because then you'll get some pumping in your signal. So what I'm doing here is I'm high passing the signal going into the compressor. So I'm gonna solo this and you can hear the side chain. Now this is simply the signal being used to trigger the compressor. It's not the actual signal coming out. So we're high passing that bottom end so that energy doesn't affect the compressor. And then we go back to the compressor, adjust the uh, threshold. Again, the idea here, you just want to apply about one to two dB of gain reduction. And there's a number on the bottom here to show you uh, how much gain reduction is happening. <music> So I'm using a ratio of two and my attack is at 75 milliseconds so you can preserve those transients otherwise it's going to sound squashed and flat and you lose the dynamics and you set the release to about 100 uh, milliseconds and that allows the music to breathe. And then at the final stage of the compressor I'm adding 1.5 dB of gain to make up for the compression. So that does some gain staging at the end. So here it is without the compressor. And here it is with. All right, in the final stage of the dynamic section, I'm using a clipper. And what the clipper does is it flattens or trims out those super high peaks that's beyond the threshold. And this gives us a little more control of those peaks so that the limiter does not have to work as hard. So again, we're only aiming for around a one dB of clipping. So you want to adjust the drive or threshold accordingly to get that 1 dB of uh, clipping. And then you can hear the delta, which is the actual peaks that are getting affected. So nothing major, just those super peaks. All right, so this brings us to the end of the mastering stage. And all this is then sent to the limiter to give us that overall loudness. So let's compare our signal before all the processing. And I'll just keep the limiter on so we still have that loudness to compare to. So this is before the processing. <laughs> And here it is with the processing. And let's check this against our reference. And yeah, sounds close, sounds good to me. And by the way, if you're wondering, the reference track is a foreign concept remix of my track, Don't Talk. It was originally mastered by Bob Mack at Subvert Mastering. He's a good friend of mine and a mastering wizard. So hit him up if you need some mastering services. So once you're done with the mastering stage, you can then export your file and you probably want to export it as a WAV file. And you just want to make sure you're uh, rendering it down to 16 bit audio, 44 kilohertz. Other than that, you can hit render and then export your file. Once you're done mastering the track, I like to import it into an audio editor just to have a look at the WAV format. 
I have an appreciation for master files. I like looking at how the waveform looks like. You got that nice loud sausage look. Just by looking at the waveform, it looks nice and fat and it's ready to be played in a set. So there's no confusion. Here's a recap of the order of my process. We began with some EQing to attain some tonal balance, followed by some multiband compression for some tonal control. And then we added some coloration and character by using some plugins for their analog modeling. We followed this with some compression to control the dynamics. And finally, we added a limiter at the end of the chain for overall loudness. All right, as you can see, mastering is a pretty involved process and it really takes a specific kind of character and ear to get it right. It's gonna take time to tune your ears to listen to those nuances in each step. However, the more you do it, the more you'll get better. Also, if you wanna support me, remember you can grab my Gnarly Serum preset pack as well. I have a number of Ableton project files which you can use to jumpstart your next idea. But if you're not ready yet, you can pick up my free sample pack or my free Serum preset pack. All right, that's pretty much it for today, guys. Thanks for watching. Keep practicing. I'll see you at the next video.